we want to welcome you to Tone Your Bones. Um, we're excited because this is a multidisciplinary um, talk, so you're not just going to hear one side of the story, you're going to hear several sides of the story when it comes to your bones. I'm Julie Christensen, I'm from Children's Minnesota Hospital, um, and I welcome you. And I'm Valerie Tarn, I'm Nutrition Faculty and Training Director for the Pediatric Pulmonary Center at UAB. So, we will go ahead and get started. And I do appreciate all of you for sticking out this mm -hmm. last session. So, um, our first speaker today is Morgan Denhart. She is the Clinical Nutrition Manager at John Hopkins Children's Center and has been caring for infants and children with cystic fibrosis since she joined their team in 2016. Previously, she completed the Pediatric Pulmonary Traineeship at the University of Florida as part of her Master's in Science Dietetic Internship Program, which sparked her interest in CF. She is interested in improving nutrition education and care for patients with increased risk factors related to their social determinants of, of health, building relationships with other specialties to improve nutrition-related outcomes in patients with CF and also thinking about what the future of CF care will look like for most patients. Without further ado, Morgan, please begin our presentation. And we will be taking questions after each presentation, so um, please just put your questions mm -hmm. in the app. Awesome. Looks good. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you, Valerie, for the introduction. Um, my name is Morgan Denhard, and I'm very excited to be kicking off, which, as Valerie mentioned, is one of the last sessions of NACFC 2022. I have no relationships to disclose related to this presentation. Um, so today, as Valerie mentioned, this is an interdisciplinary session and I'm the nutrition representative so let's start by discussing the relationship between nutrition and bone health and CF consider some of the best practices for evaluation and improving the status of specific bone health related nutrients of concern explore how CFTR modulators may have an effect on nutritional status and in turn bone health and finally highlight the role of the RD in helping patients at their center optimize bone health Let's start off by defining what cystic fibrosis related bone disease is and put in simple terms, it's a common complication of CF and is characterized by low bone mineral density and increased rates of fractures. I'll leave the rest of that to our endocrinologist part of the presentation and get back to nutrition. Um, so while we know the causes of CF bone disease, bone disease are multifactorial, this presentation will focus specifically on the nutrition related components of CF bone disease. So looking more at malabsorption of fat soluble vitamins and poor nutritional status. So while we will discuss the importance of various micronutrients today, I would be remiss if I did not first emphasize that by and large, overall calorie and protein intake in tandem with physical activity are the most significant nutrition related predictors of bone health. So before you start Picking a part of patient's vitamin D level, it's important to take a step back and assess what their overall nutrition status is um, and what their growth looks like. So the CF clinical care guidelines recommend DEXAs for patients over eight years who are less than 90% of their ideal body weight. Being at a healthy weight and BMI tends to correlate with increased lean body mass, which allows for normal physical activity, which is great for your bones. As we know, BMI is used to identify ideal body weight for people with CF, which is an imperfect measure as it does not account for height. Just like bone disease, short stature in CF is likely not caused or resolved by nutrition alone. Um, but we do know it's often a sign of prolonged and adequate nutrition that has led to impaired linear growth, even if the person is now at a normal BMI or proportionate weight for their height. So looking at BMI alone could miss patients at risk due to short stature related to stunting. Um, and of course, steroid use and inflammation also influence linear growth. That being said, it's not surprising that there's also a strong correlation identified between height and bone mineral density. 
So now that we've established the importance of optimizing overall nutrition and growth, let's talk about some micronutrients of concern. It's important to ensure a calcium-rich diet, of course, at least annually, in conjunction with monitoring vitamin D intake and status, given the relationship between the two nutrients. A calcium-deficient diet can reduce bone strength. When it comes to assessing calcium intake, keep in mind that even if sufficient intake is reported, if there is concern for ongoing um, malabsorption due to uncontrolled pancreatic insufficiency, that intake may not be getting fully absorbed. The CF Clinical Care Guidelines for Bone Disease, which were initially published in 2005 and renewed without changes in 2021, recommends meeting the DRI for calcium intake, or about 1,300 to 1,500 milligrams per day for adults. The reference numbers shown here are based on the current calcium adequate intake for zero to 12 months and the RDA for one year and up. Um, so depending on what reference set you're looking at, you might get slightly different numbers, but in general, the dietary guidelines are a good place to start. Um, unlike vitamin D, deciding whether or not to supplement with calcium can be a tough call. Um, so in absence of a severe deficiency that's caused um, labs that show something like rickets, for instance, there's not really a good lab marker to assess like whether or not the patient is meeting their calcium needs through their diet. Your serum calcium will stay normal. Um, so calcium supplements are not specifically recommended in the CF clinical care guidelines, and sometimes supplements can cause problems of their own. Um, so it's worth weighing the pros and cons before starting. In my practice, I tend to reserve calcium supplementation for patients who are clearly unwilling or unable to meet um, the DRI for age via food products or nutrition shakes or some combination of that alone, and would probably discuss with the physician prior to starting in patients who already have CF bone disease or who are at risk for CF bone disease despite adequate intake. Um, we will get to vitamin D, but I did want to sneak in vitamin K too, which is a less thought about vitamin. Obviously, we think about calcium and vitamin D when it comes to bone health, um, but vitamin K is really important too. Um, it's a cofactor, which activates osteocalcin, which then binds calcium directly and concentrates it in the bone. And prior studies have shown that vitamin K supplementation increases carboxylated osteocalcin levels after one month of daily supplementation, which makes sense because the osteocalcin needs vitamin K to be carboxylated or active. With this in mind, you would think that um, vitamin K supplementation would make a lot of sense in patients at risk for CF bone disease, but the only published study in the CF population did not find correlation between increased carboxylated osteocalcium calcium and bone mineralization after one year of high-dose vitamin K supplementation, which was 10 milligrams weekly. Um, that being said, we know that standard CF vitamin dosing, for example, two decas plus daily for an adult, provides two milligrams daily, which far exceeds the 0 0.3 to 0 0.5 milligrams per day recommended. Um, and there seems to be generally low risk in starting additional supplementation if felt to be needed. Um, and then in terms of assessing vitamin K stores, if you have ever been successful at your clinic in getting a PIVCA tutor result, kudos to you. We have not had that luck at my center, and we tend to rely on the more imperfect measure of PTINR to get a proxy measure of vitamin K status and may consider starting supplementation if prolonged. And then, of course, we can't have a discussion about nutrition and bone health without mentioning vitamin D, which is responsible for calcium absorption from the gut and subsequently for optimal bone health and muscle function. Um, I found this during my pre like preparing for this presentation that without adequate vitamin D, only 10 to 15% of dietary calcium and 60% of phosphorus gets absorbed. Um, and we know that, of course, that there's a good, good lab marker for vitamin D, vitamin D 25-hydroxy. Uh, which should be monitored at least annually, and then every three months if you're escalating the dose. While the minimum recommended daily intake for vitamin D are listed here, the CFF target level is greater than 30, and at our center and of course across the nation, we found that some patients have a really hard time reaching this level, even with very high doses, upwards of 50,000 international units daily for a month. Um, and my impression is this is likely due to some combination of adherence, malabsorption, maybe inadequate sun exposure. Um, but in the early 2000s, studies indicated that vitamin D insufficiency or deficiency was present in 75 to 80 percent of adults with CF. Um, while there is more attention given to vitamin D than calcium or vitamin K, for example, 
there really isn't good correlation between vitamin D and bone mineral density in the general population or in the CF population. However, there is strong correlation between vitamin D and other CF-related health outcomes, such as FAV1. So while important, correcting the vitamin D level may not automatically lead to improvements in bone mineral density. So as we saw on the last slide, the 2012 guidelines for vitamin D were reapproved in 2019 without changes. Um, to me, I think whenever you mention the vitamin D guidelines, they're like, when are they going to update them? They're so low. And then we're like, oh, actually, it was just quietly reapproved without any changes. So that led me to wonder whether or not are these really are these dosing guidelines effective in normalizing levels? And a recently published paper just looked at this as well, um, comparing two cohorts of pediatric and young adult patients with the average age of eight and a half years and looking at their vitamin D status pre and post the updated vitamin D guidelines from 2012. So cohort one included patients who were cared for in 2012 and 2013. And they were cared for using those 2002 guidelines, which are in the leftmost corner. Um, and then cohort two included patients cared for in years 2014 to 2016 based on the 2012 CFF guidelines and the 2016 European Cystic Fibrosis Society guidelines, which are incrementally higher than the 2002 previous guidelines. Patients in cohort two did receive significantly higher doses of vitamin D daily, so about 1,500 units per day compared to close to 1,100 units per day. Both are much higher than the recommended amounts in the table. Um, and they were found to have higher vitamin D levels in cohort two compared to cohort one. The prevalence of deficiency was also higher in cohort one, though it was not found to be statistically significant. And after adjusting for confounding factors, patients in cohort one had a higher risk of vitamin D insufficiency compared to cohort two. So overall, after the implementation of the new guidelines, higher doses of vitamin D were given to patients, um, exceeding even the amounts recommended in the guidelines, which led to a parallel increase in serum levels and decreased risk of deficiency. However, even with this updated dosing regimen, almost a third of CF patients still showed vitamin D insufficiency. But it's worth noting that even though this paper was published in 2021, it was based on data for cohort two, the most recent group was from 2014 to 2016, which at, at which time most patients with CF were not eligible for a CFTR modulator. So that led me to kind of look into a little bit more what the effect is potentially of CFTR modulators on vitamin D levels. Emerging research does indicate that modulators might have a significant impact on vitamin D status. A recent retrospective chart review from University of Iowa looked at their adult patients who started Trikafta with no change in vitamin D dosing, and their median increase in serum vitamin D was five nanograms per mil. These authors theorize that it's potentially due to changes in absorption or vitamin D processing and utilization in the body. Um, of course, further studies are needed to assess the impact in regard to whether this increased lab value leads to clinical outcomes related to bone health. Um, I also saw a poster here with um, data from Seattle Children's and University of Wisconsin, and they compared pre and post modulator, what effect it had on the different vitamin levels. While they did see a mild increase, I think it was about two nanograms per milliliter for vitamin D, the effect on vitamin A was much more significant. Um, but they did notice a significant increase in their data as well in vitamin D. Um, taking it back to just our own pediatric center, very rough and unofficial data, but we've kind of been looking more at our own vitamin D process as well in our clinic as part of a recent QI project. Um, and we were pretty shocked to find that of our patients who had a vitamin D level checked in 2021, um, which included 189 pediatric patients, 83% of them had a normal vitamin D level and required no further intervention or increased dosing. So these numbers are pretty high. It's probably similar, if not better, than the general population. Um, that being said, we know that standard dosing gives a pretty good amount of vitamin D, far exceeding the current guidelines, and that might also be why, why these levels were um, overwhelmingly normal. We're looking now at comparing this data to years prior, um, 2020, 2019, 
and then look forward to seeing our data this year from 2022 and kind of dig into this information a little bit deeper. But we're also suspecting that the modulators may have perhaps had an impact on improving levels, either directly or indirectly, such as in increased sun exposure. So now that we've gone through the many specific nutrients related to bone health, let's bring it back to the clinic and how we can take this knowledge um, home with us. We know that in the pre, uh, like the preclinic meeting, there's a lot of different disciplines involved, and a recent publication found that there is room for improvement in most CF centers to improve screening practices and identification for patients at risk for CF bone disease. And our clinic is certainly included in that. We are by no means doing this perfectly, at least in our pediatric setting. Um, but this got me to thinking about how important it is to really designate which team member is going to own this screening process, even if many disciplines, physical therapy, nutrition, nursing, or the physician note that the patient meets one of the following criteria for needing a DEXA, being able to know that someone is kind of monitoring that information and bringing it together to get the DEXA completed. So um, we can see here on this list that in children eight years old, if they're less than 90% of their ideal body weight, that would be from nutrition. There's many medical risk factors as well. Um, and then we may also be keeping an eye on something like steroids. So kind of bringing this back to your clinic and making sure that someone is keeping an eye on this and referring the appropriate patients to get a DEXA. So now that we're moving from preclinic and our brains being in clinic with the patient, I would say um, consider following the two-year nutrition annual. I know for me, if something's in my nutrition note template, I'm much less likely to skim over it, especially if it's an area I'm trying to be more thoughtful about in my assessments. You know, it's easy to kind of think about it a lot at a conference, but then you get back to it and um, it kind of leaves your brain unless you have something that's like forcing you to kind of um, remember to do it while you're working on gaining that, um, that skill in clinic. So under the section where typical diet intake is listed, you could consider adding just like a drop down, like generally seems to be meeting calcium DRI for age, yes or no. Might not be like a perfect, like getting 900 milligrams a day, but just um, signifying whether or not there's some good calcium sources in the diet. If the answer seems to be no, of course, you can clarify with the patient, make sure that they're not missing any major sources and then provide education right at the time of visit if it's found to be lacking. Um, we've also found in our clinic that creating educational smart phrases has been really helpful as you can just quickly add it to the patient's after visit instructions and it's viewable in their portal. We've gone um, pretty paperless. So sometimes I worry that some of the printed resources get lost or they can't refer back to when they're trying to figure out what their dose should be. Um, and then in terms of vitamins and minerals, either communicating with the pharmacist or doing your own review um, and going through whether or not they're taking the vitamins and minerals as prescribed. I'm sure a lot of us have found that many of our patients have a high pill burden and they just don't see the benefit to vitamin or, or mineral supplements, or they're kind of turned off by the size or the after flavor, things that we can help address and troubleshoot. So, um, reviewing the importance of why these vitamins and minerals need to be taken or what some different options could be would be helpful. Um, if you don't have a physical therapist in the clinic, you might be the only person as a registered dietitian who's asking about and encouraging physical activity. Um, if there is a PT in your clinic, like I'm so lucky to have, <laughs> um, it's important to kind of coordinate an information share with them as well. Sometimes I'll hear something about a sport that a patient is in and share with Holly or vice versa and we'll um, kind of work together with information sharing. And then finally, if you do note that the patient has um, another nutrition related risk factor such as a prolonged steroid course, you could communicate with the physician to determine whether the dose or length is putting that patient at risk for bone disease. I think while this isn't necessarily the role of the dietitian to know the exact doses that meet DEXA criteria. We know that steroids can cause many nutrition related problems. So sometimes we might be the only person keeping an eye on this more so than others in terms of how it relates to nutrition concerns. So finally, after the patients left clinic and the labs start to trickle in in the next day or so, it can be easy for us um, as busy clinicians to move on to the next person in front of us and kind of fail to complete the follow through on abnormal lab results. As part of our team's vitamin D QI project over this past year, we've been working on developing better smart phrase messaging that can be used to um, give like a customized 
recommendation based on lab result and age. Um, and along with a phone call, we're sending this information as well so that we have really good information provided on how to get the correct vitamin D based on their insurance, um, which could either be a prescription or over the counter, depending on what situation they fall in. And we found this tends to ensure that the patient does get the correct information and they can refer back to it if it's a little bit of a complicated, like, use this link if this place doesn't have that and make sure that they have a product we're comfortable with. Um, of course, if the patient had a DEXA as part of their clinic follow-up plan, we'd refer back to the endocrinologist to help make recommendations for next steps. Of course, it might be helpful to develop a relationship with your endocrinologist so that you can easily communicate regarding need for additional micronutrient supplementation as well. And regardless of what the DEXA does show, the CFF guidelines for bone health recommend optimizing nutrition by ensuring calcium, vitamin D, and vitamin K. Um, and ensuring that intake is optimized and working with the patient to improve their weight status. So aside from potentially adding supplementation of these micronutrients, the nutrition goals and care will generally be unchanged throughout. So in summary, there are many risk factors for CF bone disease, some of which are nutrition related and the rest of which we'll hear about next. Current practice guidelines do recommend optimizing nutrition status regardless of DEXA score. Um, I think we'll, we're all interested to see the role of CFTR modulators and potentially mitigating nutrition-related risk factors for CF bone disease, and it's an emerging topic of interest. And the CF dietitian can advocate for patients' bone health during pre-visit planning, annual nutrition evaluations, and as part of follow-up. Thank you so much. I enjoyed speaking with you all about this topic and look forward to hearing from the rest of the panel. Thank you. Thank you, Morgan. We have received a question. Awesome. Are there um, foods rich in calcium, vitamin D, and vitamin K that you recommend if a patient is reluctant to take supplements? Are you aware of any studies that look at dietary modifications that lead to improved vitamin levels? Good question. I guess I did forget to talk about the foods, huh? <laughs> Um, I think calcium is an easy one. We go through a lot of calcium diet education um, in terms of dairy or if the patient is in a milk drinker, some other option, soy milk or some kind of other going through their day, they might drink orange juice or something that ha has a good source of calcium in it. That's really the biggest one that I focus on from a food related standpoint to meet their goal. Um, there are foods of course in vitamin K that are hard to remember off the top of my head at this very minute. I want to say like spinach and things like that. Yeah, leafy greens. Um, and sure, you can recommend that, but I feel like it's hard to, um, if you're specifically dosing for a unique concern and someone's going to eat that every day, then you think about how that competes with calcium for absorption and it gets a little tricky. So I'd probably have to look back at it. But if there was a patient who was like, I really want to do this through food, I think we could figure it out and kind of do the equivalent amount um, and make it work so that we could avoid adding extra pills. Vitamin D is a really tough one. Um, there are some foods that do like fortify with extra vitamin D, but it's really hard to get enough vitamin D from your diet alone. And um, not to make it sound like totally worthless or not beneficial, but the amount of vitamin D already in your standard CF vitamin dose is so significant that getting any extra little boost from your food is probably not going to make a huge um, change in your overall dose. I think sun exposure is something that we could recommend, again, if a patient was really trying to minimize their pill burden or wasn't open to taking CF vitamins. In terms of the study about dietary changes, I would have to look into that more. Um, I'm guessing it's hard to really, it's hard to know what people were really eating, and sometimes those studies aren't perfect too, but it would be great if we could see more information on that. Of course, it's best to get your nutrition from food, so if there's a way to do so um, and the patient's motivated, we can make it happen. We have another question. Mm -hmm. Would you be willing to share your smart phrases for vitamins? Oh, I hope I didn't make them sound too impressive, <laughs> of course. <laughs> uh, we've like been doing some trial and error. I think what we found is that it does get so complicated. When some patients' vitamin D is low, their insurance will, you can send it to the pharmacy. And then other people's, they have to go buy it themselves. Um, and then depending on like how often you're in clinic or how frequently you're doing this, it can be really hard to keep that straight. So we've been trying to give very consistent recommendations um, and then also just knowing that some vitamins or supplements are more reliable than others. So we wanted to give specific brands that we recommend. 
And it's just really hard to keep it straight, different ages, was it insufficient, was it deficient? And so for anyone who's not you know, doing it every day, um, it can be really hard to kind of remember off the top of your head. Um, but I'd definitely be willing to share that CF Nutrition listserv I'm on, and we can send out what's been working for us. Um, and then, yeah, for calcium, we just have like a general calcium smart phrase as well. That's probably just a, like pulled from a paper resource that we copy pasted and put in a smart phrase. So nothing too special about that one. And we can also mm -hmm. add the smart phrases to the oh, app. That'd be awesome. Yeah, yeah let's so do it. I can just get that from you. Next question. Do you absorb vitamin D if you wear sunscreen? So, <laughs> I think what they say to do, because it, like, there's, it makes, like, the dermatologist mad if you say to wait five minutes, but I think they say it's best if you, like, wait five minutes and then you put your sunscreen on, but I'm not, probably not the person to ask about this. You probably get some, and it probably depends on your pigmentation as well. You should definitely wear sunscreen. <laughs> Good answer. Good answer. All right, one more question. Hmm. Although you mentioned you don't recommend calcium supplementation, would you consider it if you had a patient with dietary restrictions like lactose intolerance? Mm -hmm. Yep, and we do have patients on calcium supplementation. I just think we're so, like, vitamin D is low, you dose your vitamin D, you don't think twice about it. Calcium is not exactly the same way. We don't always start calcium if you're on prolonged steroids, for instance. We kind of weigh the risks and benefits. Um, so we do, we have patients um, on either like calcium carbonate or calcium citrate. Sometimes there's concern that the calcium carbonate isn't as well absorbed if you're on a PPI, which a lot of CF patients are. I think there's some conflicting um, thoughts about it, but usually we'll use whatever's more accessible to the patient, either one's okay. Um, and typically we'll just keep in mind that we would dose to meet roughly the DRI for age, but also a reasonable dose. And keep in mind that you can only absorb about 300 to 500 milligrams at a time. So instead of doing the whole dose at once, maybe divide it into split dosing. All right. Thank you, Morgan. Awesome. Thanks, guys. So Morgan brought up the idea of a PT in the clinic. So I would like to introduce Chelsea Rogan. She is a senior physical therapist at University Hospital's Cleveland Medical Center where she splits her time between inpatient cystic fibrosis and the intensive care unit. She has worked with adult patients with cystic fibrosis since 2018 and serves as the physical therapy team lead overseeing all inpatient care. She is also working in the outpatient clinic as a member of the multidisciplinary team to perform PT evaluations and create interventions during annual visits. Fun fact, in her spare time, Chelsea enjoys spending time outdoors, hiking and running, doing yoga, and promoting an overall healthy lifestyle. Let's welcome Chelsea. Thank you. Okay. All right. Can I do you first? Oh, this one first, sorry. everyone. I'm so excited to be here. I love talking about CF and exercise. Um, I had a lot to talk about. I tried to cut it down as much as possible. So I will try not to bore you with all the information I want to tell everybody, but I hope you enjoy. Um, I have no, uh, nothing to disclose to this presentation. Okay, so today I'm going to start with defining some terms related to exercise and bone health. Um, some of these terms you might know, um, they might be new to some people. I know we have an interdisciplinary group here. Um, so some of the PTs might say, oh, I know that already, and that's okay. We'll get a little bit of a review. Um, we'll talk about um, those in the context of CF patient and CF care. And then I'll show you some examples of how to apply this to exercise programming and specific exercises for this group across the lifespan, including uh, transplant, pre and post, and our aging CF population. Um, based on my experience working in the uh, hospital setting, PT is often thought of to supplement airway clearance and improve cardiovascular fitness. 
However, one of the underappreciated benefits of PT is that it can and should be used as a primary way to improve bone health for patients of any fitness level or lung disease severity. To start off with one of our definitions for the day, what is weight-bearing exercise? Um, there are two categories that you can put into, cardiovascular and resistance exercise. Um, cardiovascular exercise is any vigorous activity that increases heart rate and respiration and raises oxygen and blood flow throughout the body. Some examples of weight-bearing exercise that's also cardio might be hopping, running, jumping, and stair climbing. Um, some examples of cardio that is not weight-bearing um, would be bike riding and swimming. So also great cardio exercises, but would not be great for this specific discussion. And then resistance exercise is also called strength training or weight training, and it's the use of resistance to muscular contraction to build strength, anaerobic endurance, and the size of musculoskeletal um, muscles. And some examples of resistance exercise will be talked about uh, later on throughout my presentation. So as physical therapists, we really specialize in finding non-pharmacological strategies to help our patients manage a variety of impairments. Uh, next up is the osteogenic effect. Um, osteogenic literally means producing bone. And so that's extremely important for all these exercises because that's what we're really trying to do with these patients. Um, for CF, inadequate bone mineral accrual during growth and accelerated bone, bone demineralization in adulthood are recognized as additional and serious complications for these patients. Um, it's important to start weight-bearing exercises early to induce bone formation and to slow down demineralization in adulthood. Um, some resistance exercises activities are, are seen up here. I don't need to read through all of them. And these are just four examples. There are so many other ones as well. Um, but the, the main thing to think about is that a variety of muscular loads are applied on the bone during these types of exercises, which will stimulate and produce what we know as the osteogenic effect. So now we have a little background on weight-bearing exercise and its effect on bone density. We can move on to specific considerations for our CF population. Keeping in mind, it's very important to do a full postural assessment prior to designing any program. Um, when developing a strength training program, we really want to focus on strengthening the weak muscles and stretching the tight ones. Um, listed here are some of the more common postural deviations. Um, we have an increased thoracic kyphosis, increased forward head posture, and increased lumbar lordosis, just to name a few. Um, I want to see if I can get this. Uh, there we go. Okay. I, I don't think it worked. I'm sorry. I was trying to get the little. There we go. Okay. So we have the thoracic kyphosis, which is right here, um, which is really just a forward bend of the upper back, for those of you that aren't familiar. I'll also be calling it a hyperkyphosis. That all means the same thing. Um, so this is just showing in this picture um, a very common postural deviation that we'll see with a lot of our CF patients. So one of the complications from that could be increased risk of compression fractures. And with increased forward head posture, we'll find a lot of patients that have neck pain, shoulder pain, um, just from these postural impairments. Um, one of the reasons that we see the tightness in the anterior chest and shoulder region are due to time spent in the tripod position. Um, the tripod position temporarily moves the diaphragm downward, increasing volume in the thoracic cavity. Um, so I think most of us know what the tripod position looks like, but if you're not familiar, um, it really helps them with their work of breathing. So you might see our patients leaning forward on their, on their elbows, kind of bent down, and that really helps them temporarily. Um, for posture, though, it's not the best. So this also allows the use of accessory muscles when breathing, providing that temporary relief, but causing long-term tightness in the anterior chest and shoulders. So many of, the op many of the muscles that work opposite of the typical tight ones will also become weak. Um, I know there's a lot going on up here, as you'll see there's a lot going on in a lot of my slides. Um, but I just listed some of the common weak ones and tight ones. Like I said before, it's not for everybody that you'll see in clinic, but these are some of the ones that I've just noticed come up over and over again. So, oh, I sorry, I missed something. <laughs> um, another quick thing to note is that muscular tightness also does affect rib cage expansion, which also will affect lung expansion. Um, the lateral trunk muscles and the anterior chest muscles all have attachments to the ribs. When these muscles are shortened, it limits available space for lungs to fully expand. In addition, this thoracic hyperkyphosis 
reduces amount of space in the chest, limiting mobility of the rib cage and expansion of the lungs. So these are all really important things that, you know, more have to do with the breathing pattern, but also really affect the skeletal muscles and the bones. Okay, a little brief review of resistance exercise. Um, for our purposes, there's two types, isometric and isotonic. Um, all of the exercises I will go over later on fall into one of these two categories. Um, isotonic exercises are a lot of the exercises that we think of when we go to the gym and we see people lifting weights, doing bicep curls, shoulder presses, chest presses, where isometric exercises are a lot of our yoga poses that we're holding, um, maybe 10 seconds, 20 seconds, a little bit longer. Okay, ways to measure intensity. So a lot of the PT talks I went to talked about intensity already. So some of this might be a review, but I tried to make a slide that compared the three different common ones. Um, the first one are MET levels, which are metabolic equivalent. And this is a number that indicates the relative rate at which you burn calories during an activity. Everyone right now is sitting, relaxing, you're all about at a MET level of one, and then it goes up from there. Um, another way to measure intensity, which is my favorite, is using the Borg Rate of Perceived Exertion Scale, and this is subjective. So you would show your patients a scale and ask them how they're doing during an activity. Um, maybe right after they're finished or even after the workout, you can ask how the workout was. Um, for our inpatients, I usually try to keep that level at a 13 or under, um, just so they're not doing a high or a vigorous activity while they're also in the hospital trying to get better on, you know, IV antibiotics. Um, but they can, you know, our, our patients can go all the way up to 17, 18. And percentage heart rate max. Um, my favorite way to calculate this is using the Carbonin formula. That is a formula, and I didn't put it up here, but it is a formula that uses resting heart rate to calculate the patient's relative heart rate max. A lot of other people just use the simple 220 minus age. That's okay, too. Um, this is really just showing different ways to measure intensity. And so it can help with our programming and then also knowing when to increase or decrease a specific exercise with your patient. Okay. This is another wordy slide, <laughs> but I had to get all the information on here. So now that we've discussed the background information and defined some terms, let's really look at what CF patients across the lifespan should be doing to use exercise to manage their bone health and how we as healthcare providers can steer them in the right direction. So I find it's really important to instill good exercise habits in children when they're young, as CF, as I talked about before, does tend to result in inadequate bone mineral accrual during these growth periods. Um, also of note, um, in the general healthy population, um, usually in your late 20s, that's when we reach our peak bone mass. Um, after this, it normally starts decreasing. So another reason why it's really great to get to our kids and adolescents before they've really stopped um, decreasing their bone mass to get them to build as much as possible. Um, a lot of parents may wonder if it's safe for their children to participate in resistance exercise. There's a lot of different literature out there. Most of it says yes, that we should be encouraging our children to participate in this type of exercise as long as it's in a safe and supervised program. Um, this also helps really influence bone growth and development um, by increasing that bone mineral density during this important time. Um, I broke it up into four categories. My favorite part is older adult because we can look at older adults now. We have CF patients that are 65 and up and so they're experiencing some of the same bone mineral problems that older adults are having, such as osteoporosis just by aging, not, not even related to CF. Um, so it's really important to look at these adults too and also look at not just the CF-related um, bone mineral density, but also maybe, maybe we've got postmenopausal women that are dealing with decreased bone mineral density and we need to be talking to them about the importance of weight bearing. Um, really focusing on safe supervision all across the lifespan. I think I might have highlighted it more with children and older adult, but it's really something that should really be at every stage. Um, and then also encouraging children to do something they like to do so they don't grow up feeling like exercise is a chore, they want to participate in it. Okay, so next I'm going to talk about the FIT principle. Um, the FIT principle is an exercise prescription to help our participants understand how long and hard they should exercise. And it helps us as practitioners figure out what frequency, intensity, time duration, and type that they should be doing. 
Um, frequency is how many days per week. Intensity, as we talked about before, lots of different ways of measuring it. Um, I did highlight up here what's called 1RM, or one repetition max, and that is actually the amount of weight that somebody could lift one time, the maximum amount of weight. I do not test this with my CF patients. If anybody is, let me know. I'd love to hear about it. Um, I just, I don't really find safety, at least in my, I'm mostly in the inpatient side of testing how much my inpatients can safely lift one time. But a lot of the literature looks at children and adults and looking at percentages. So for children starting off, 30 to 60% of the weight that they can safely lift one time, and then higher repetitions, lower amount of sets. Um, so you'll see 12 to 20 repetitions, and then moving up um, into adulthood, uh, lower amount of reps and increasing the intensity and increasing the sets for that. Um, and then for exercise order, we want to begin with gross motor, more complex movements, and then transitioning to less fatiguing and isolated exercise. Um, so think of the, I didn't really talk about on here the, the RPE method, which I talked about before with the 6 to 20 scale. You can still use this for resistance exercise. It's just a lot of the literature doesn't use that to show the intensity. But if you remember the slide, it does line up. So you can look at percentage of heart rate max, and you can line that up with the rate of perceived exertion. So you can use this for resistance exercise, too. OK, and then also for our adult and older adult population, um, or even our younger uh, children or adolescents that might be suffering, that might have osteoporosis or osteopenia, you want to avoid the heavy load twisting. So think about that motion of an exercise where you would like pick something heavy up off the ground and then also twist or bending forward. You want to avoid those types of exercises. Okay, and then we can also apply this to cardiovascular exercise. Um, there does seem to be more in the literature for this type of exercise prescription due to the obvious benefits of cardio exercise and airway clearance um, related to our CF population. So there does seem to be a little bit more that I found. Um, according to the American Heart Association guidelines for non-CF, a high correlation does exist between the perceived exertion level and the heart rate. So I did put up here those Borg RPE scales because those did correlate more in the studies that I was looking at um, with intensity levels and, and heart rate levels as well. Um, like I said, just some examples up here of different types of exercises you can do, and then also the time and duration. Um, they do recommend children and adolescents get about 60 minutes a day, and then adult and older adult, 150 minutes a week, um, or 75 minutes a week of more higher intensity exercise. Okay, here comes my exercises. <laughs> All right, I broke them up into some upper body, lower body, and core. Um, these are some of my favorite exercises, so I wanted to share them with you. Um, and if anyone wants more exercises, let me know, because I have a lot more. OK, first one. Um, so the following, um, the, this one is a great one to encourage good posture. So if we remember the slide that I showed you before with the postural abnormalities. This is one of, well, they're all my favorite, but this is one that I like. Um, this one is a really good one for scapular retraction, for decreasing that thoracic hyperkyphosis. So the first picture is the beginning part, and then the second one is the end part. So it looks like this is the exercise. You're pulling the band apart. And then as you pull apart, you breathe in through your nose. This allows for the lungs to expand while the rib cage opens up and good thoracic spine extension, and then breathing out as you bring your hands back together. Okay, next one, um, we also know these are shoulder raises. Um, they're also called IYs and Ts just because of the letter that each one makes. Um, this one is great for scapular stabilizers again, um, but you want to ensure correct posture before beginning. Have your patient squeeze your shoulder blades before starting, and then you're going to go up in the air. So the first one is straight out, second one is a Y formation, then the last one is out to the side. And so those are great, um, a great shoulder exercise, too, for our patients. Okay, following three exercises, I really chose, because these are great to help strengthen the muscles surrounding the hips and the knees prior to lung transplant. Um, these muscles are commonly affected by long-term corticosteroid-induced use, also known as corticosteroid-induced myopathy, and primarily affects the proximal muscles. 
Um, so the first one is hip abduction, where the um, you're going to raise, it's like a, a leg raise, basically. There's a weight on the, the leg that's coming up in the air, and then the leg that's on the ground is really doing most of the work by stabilizing the hips. The second one is a chair pose, and this is the one that I want everyone to do with me today. Who wants to get up? Okay, if your pants allow it. <laughs> Nobody rip their pants, okay? You are going to sit back like you're sitting in your chair, but go as low as you can with before sitting and keep the weight on your heels and breathe. Nobody hold their breath. We're just going to hold for 10 seconds. If you need to stop early, that's okay. Just want everyone to get a feeling of this. Anyone with knee pain, keep the weight on the heels. Three, two, one. Okay. Was that hard? Easy? Nobody liked it? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And then, good job, everybody. <laughs> and then the last exercise is a lunge. Um, you, it's a little hard to see in this picture. I have uh, the gentleman have a bar on the back of his, it's like right below the neck. Um, it's actually a pull stick, but you could use anything. And that promotes that really good thoracic spine extension we were talking about. A lot of people tend to lean forward a little bit when doing lunges, and that kind of gets you in that position of hunched over that we're trying to get our patients out of. So that's just a little bit of a modification that I like to use. You don't have to do that if you do lunges, but just a little tidbit. Okay. Um, these are two isometric exercises, um, planks and bridges. I'm sure a lot of us are familiar with those. Um, nothing really special in these. Um, the plank, you're weight bearing through your arms, so that's a really good one. You can also progress it by having them weight bear through their hands and get in that high push-up position. Um, there's a lot of modifications, but these are just some of the easier ones, harder ones. And then bridges can also be progressed to single leg bridge. Um, and then also just making sure if you're having anyone hold the poses that they're really breathing through it. I mean, we always know when an exercise is hard, it's so easy to hold your breath. So that's really the big thing, um, especially with our patients that might have more breathing difficulties that are on oxygen. Um, we just want to make sure that they're being safe. Okay. Just a few more exercises, I promise. We're almost done. Um, this one is called a bird dog. Um, this one um, is great. The core has to remain stable. That's in the first position, while the arm and the leg moves dynamically on the stable core. So the first picture is the starting position. The second one, um, the arm and the leg go reciprocally. And the foam roll is on the back to make sure it doesn't move. And this is really hard to keep the foam roller on the back. Um, a lot of people get into spinal positions where it kind of rolls off, but if it stays on, you know that their core is really stable and they're doing a good job. Um, this provides really good biomechanical feedback and helps maintain good form with alignment of the shoulders and the hips. Okay, this is actually my favorite exercise. <laughs> I promise. Um, we often don't think about strength training the diaphragm, but I think it's really important um, for inspiratory muscle training. Um, as we know, the diaphragm is the most efficient breathing muscle. Um, so in this exercise, the first position is the starting position. You would instruct your patient to breathe in through the nose and think about lifting the weight up towards the ceiling. Um, a lot of our patients like this because it also provides some good feedback so they can feel themselves breathing against it. Um, this is also great for our patients that might have a hard time diaphragmatic breathing um, and really isolating that area. And I did want to talk a little bit about some special considerations post-lung transplant. Um, as we know, um, after transplant, you can expect an increased loss of 4 to 12 percent of bone mineral density in the first year, in addition to already low bone density. Um, that's one of the reasons why I included some exercises that are really great to work with our patients before transplant to try to increase that muscle mass and bone density so it's a little bit easier for them afterwards. Um, and like we've probably talked about in every, probably in every time today, is that the vertebral fractures and osteoporosis is a consequence of the corticosteroids um, post-transplant. 
And one of the studies that I um, looked at did find the therapeutic efficacy of a six-month program using a back extension machine. So they did these with our patients post-lung transplant to look to see if there was any improvement um, in lumbar bone mineral density, and there was as evidence in the DEXA scan. So just another reason that we can use exercise to help these patients pre- and post-lung transplant. Okay, and finally, um, we've got some changes in life expectancy with highly effective modulators. Uh, less of our patients are going to be limited by pulmonary function, so they're able to participate in higher levels, and they want to. Like, they want to see what their bodies can do, and they want to weight lift and, and really challenge themselves. So we want to support them, and we don't want them to be afraid of weight lifting, and we want them to do it safely and effectively. And then also increase life expectancy um, really leads to experiencing just regular age-related changes like we were talking about in the other slide. So our adults and older adults will be having changes just from getting older, not even related to CF. So we want to support them and educate them on the benefits of exercise and how we can help them. So in conclusion, um, I hope everyone can find the value in utilizing PT as a great line of defense um, by using exercise as that added tool um, in the CF management toolbox and that we can refer our patients to physical therapy if you have one at your clinic or you can refer them to outside physical therapists. I think it's a really great way that we can help them. That's it. Chelsea, I'd like to start off with the first question. Okay. Um, what do you do for our CF patients that have some kind of bone pain, or is there certain exercises or things that you do related to pain when we want them to exercise? Right, that's a great question. Um, so we do have a lot of CF patients that do have bone pain, um, that they have the CF uh, joint arthropathy. Um, I think a lot of the isometric exercises are great. Um, so like the exercises that you're holding, the plank holds, the bridges, um, the exercises where they don't have to move their joint through the whole range of motion, but they can still get the effects of the strengthening and then also the weight bearing. Okay, another question. Um, if you can't test the R1, how do you estimate? I'm so glad you asked that. So. <laughs> I use the RPE scale <laughs> because I love that. So I actually, I could probably go back because um, it might make a little more sense. So I, did I pass it? Sorry, everyone. Okay. So I will usually use the scale, like, like let's say like 11 to 13 is moderate intensity, and that's equivalent to maybe 60 to 70%. So I will look at that as that's their, that's their max. So I might say, okay, that's 70% of the maximum amount that they can lift. Um, that's my, that's how I correlate it. Um, I don't know if that's the most scientific way. I am just not personally comfortable figuring out the maximum amount that somebody can lift um, when they're in the hospital. So that's where I do. I, I go back to this chart and I kind of look to see where things line up um, with the different intensity levels. Okay, um, this one says, thank you for your information. Um, what is a back extension machine? Oh, I'm so sorry. I should have explained that. So it, I'm going to show you how to explain this. Okay, so they have them at the gym, and you would be laying, okay, I want to see if I can get this in the right way. Okay, so you can, there's one where you lay on your stomach, and then you extend up against a weight. So the weight is like on your upper back. And so I'm not gonna get in a weird position for you guys. Um, it's a machine at the gym. It works. <laughs> it works your back extension muscles. So imagine there's a bar like against your upper back, and you could be either you could you could do it laying down on your stomach, and then you lift up, and you're you're going from this position to this position, like from here to here. Um, you could also Google back extension machine, and you would see what it looked like. <laughs> Sorry, that's the, I don't know how else to explain it. That's probably the worst way. But. More questions coming in. <laughs> um, what activities that generate high ground reaction forces for osteogenic effects? Mm -hmm. um, we heard running may not generate high enough GRFs at an earlier time. So what exercises oh, do produce really? That? I thought running was great for that. <laughs> I, think, I think running was like, didn't they label it like at a three and you needed three and above to 
actually. Yeah. It, it, ah. Okay. Mm -hmm. oh, okay, so like maybe like hopping, jumping. Okay, so is this more in children? That was more in children. Um, I mean, I would probably go towards like jumping, hopping. Um, I don't know what would be higher than that. Yeah, um, I'll think about that. Sorry. Okay. We can always answer questions yes. in the uh, app here. Um, if you do not have access to a PT, mm -hmm. is there a way you would recommend assessing physical activity in a research setting in adolescents and young adults with CF? Hmm. So if you don't have access to... To a PT, how would you, maybe, how would you have one of your other team members maybe assess this type of thing? Oh, um, I can throw. I mean, there. Sometimes mm -hmm. I know that physical therapists mm -hmm. do have maybe a checklist that somebody else on their team could actually come in and, you know, put together a list of to ask the patient these types of things, mm -hmm. so you can at least see the. Red so is this red. specific to like bone density or just exercise? If anyone wanted to mm -hmm. clarify, is it like related to exercise, like to see if they're ready to exercise or? Because I know there is a there is a physical activity part on the um, CF questionnaire. I don't, it's the CF related questionnaire. Okay. I think I might have botched that name, but there is a whole section on like physical abilities and like exercise and like if certain things are difficult for you or if you're able to exercise. So that could be a good tool to look at. Maybe okay. see where they check off on there and see if they might need like more assistance or if they're wanting to do more. Um, I would I would say probably a referral. So if you don't have a PT in your clinic and they need more exercise help, I would go more in the direction of referring to outpatient physical therapy, um, depending on what their issue is. So if it's vestibular issues, vestibular rehab, um, I wouldn't probably have, I, w I don't know if I'd have the, the team members do any like higher level physical yeah. assessments unless they're knowing what they're doing. Okay, and then we'll take one more question. Um, do your patients tend to have more buy-in to participate in PT if they have a low BDM, I mean a B? MD, body mass. Sure, yes. So a lot of our patients like to know other ways that they can help themselves. So like they don't want to take more medications. Um, a lot of them have been offered, um, you know, like the different injections. And I'm not going to speak on that because I don't know a ton about the different medications. But a lot of them do have a higher buy-in when they know that there's something that they can do that will not need them to take another medication or take another, you know, injection where they know, oh, this is something that we can do that is just exercising, that you don't have to add on to your treatment burden. So I do find that they have a good um, buy-in. And then also just educating them on things that could help them, um, picking exercises that they like to do. I wouldn't tell someone to start running if they tell me, oh, I hate running. So kind of choosing activities that they might be more likely to participate in. Okay. Thank you, Chelsea. Mm -hmm. Thank you. There were questions that we did not get to, so you can either ask Chelsea after our talk or we can answer them on the app there. Okay, I'd like to welcome our um, next speaker. Kristen Williams is an assistant professor of pediatrics at the Division of Pediatric Endocrinology and Diabetics at Columbia University Medical Center in New York. She is a recipient of the CF Foundation Envision Award for Endocrinology. She is a co-investigator and has interest in diabetes and bone health in children. Let's welcome Kristen. There we go. All right, thank you to the moderators for having me here today. So um, as you mentioned, I'm a pediatric endocrinologist at Columbia, New York, and I work with the Envision Group. So I'm going to be talking today about how we assess bone health through the use of DEXA, specifically related to CF bone disease. I have no specific disclosures related to this talk, but I do receive funding from the CF Foundation Envision 2 program. So our objectives today, we're going to look at the risk factors, some that were already mentioned, that um, impact bone health in people with CF. We'll define low bone mineral density and osteoporosis. 
We'll talk about how DEXA scans are obtained and how we interpret them. And we'll identify some of the limitations of um, DEXA reports and the evaluation of bone mineralization and fracture risk. And then we'll summarize the current available guidelines to evaluate CF bone disease. So bone disease remains a prevalent endocrine-related disorder despite advances in care for people living with CF. We know that from earlier studies, adults with CF have lower than average bone mineralization on DEXA evaluation, and that the prevalence of low bone mineral density and osteoporosis is reported in upwards of 30% of all people with CF. And as you can see here on the graph on the right, that with increasing age, average measures of bone mineral density decline, and this can start even in early childhood, indicating a need to address bone health early on. So CF bone disease is due to an excess of bone breakdown or resorption, and you get weaker bone structure and higher risk of fractures. So on the, uh, the graph on the left, this is from a longitudinal study from Germany showing the re that remaining fracture-free by 25 years of age in people with CF is reduced by 40% compared to 85% of the general non-CF population. On the, um, the table on the right, you can just see that in general, people with CF have higher rib fractures, um, cl other clinical fractures or vertebral fractures compared to a healthy population. Vertebral fractures, as we heard in the prior talk, have been reported in up to a quarter of adults living with CF. And this is really of particular importance because it's associated with worsening lung function, increased exacerbations. It can result in ineffective chest PT. It can also be a, a contraindication to transplant. The data on fracture risk and fracture history in younger children with CF are conflicting, and this is sort of standard across the board as we see in other children with um, illnesses that put them at risk of bone disease. So we heard a little bit about peak bone mass, and we know that peak bone mass is achieved by maybe your early 20s, max 30 years of age, and there's multiple factors that contribute to your maximum bone mass and strength. So we know genetics plays a really big role, weight-bearing exercise, which we just went through, sex hormones, nutrition, body size and weight, and any condition or factor that's affecting sort of your peak bone mass that's occurring early on is gonna lead to a suboptimal level and then eventually a lower level through adulthood. So there are a multitude of factors that contribute to CF bone disease. We know that chronic infection and inflammation can lead to decreased mineralization and strength, states of pancreatic insufficiency, low BMI, malabsorption, or vitamin D de um, deficiency, delayed puberty, hypogonadism, poor height growth, short stature, also um, abnormal glucose tolerance, or CFRD, all of these can impact how we accrue bone and our bone health and fracture risk. So what is a DEXA? So, or what, other, some, what we sometimes call a bone density scan. So DEXA is dual energy X-ray absorptiometry, and it's essentially an imaging tool using low dose radiation, and it's measuring bone mineral content at different locations of the body. And it's really looking at bone strength and helping us assess fracture risk. We can also use DEXA to measure body composition, looking at fat mass or fat-free or, or lean muscle mass. So how does it work? So you have two different low-dose radiation beams that are aimed at a specific location, and what you're essentially getting are different attenuation coefficients for either soft tissue, which is like fat and muscle, versus bone. And when the two beams are aimed at the, aimed at the location, you can subtract out the measure of the absorption of the soft tissue and get the measure of the bone, so essentially your bone mineral density. Um, a lot of families, when they hear about needing to get a bone density, they already have history of chest x-rays and chest CTs. They're asking, what is my radiation exposure? And as you can see here, DEXA actually is very limited radiation exposure. You can reassure your families and patients that it's less than a chest x-ray, substantially less than a chest CT, and even less than going in an airplane cross country. So often I just try to very much reassure, you know, this is very safe. But it's always important to know your radiation exposure burden over your lifetime. So when would we avoid obtaining a DEXA scan? There's no absolute contraindications, but we need to know when a study may offer a limited value. We need to know if we need to pick different locations on the body to image, or when you need to avoid or postpone. So ideally, you're not obtaining during pregnancy. If there's been any recent administration of any GI contrast, if there's any hardware or devices in the plan measure area of interest, right? If, if, if you're looking at the lumbar spine and someone has rods placed for scoliosis, right? That's gonna impact your image. 
Also, if somebody's not able to remain still, if you have someone who can't lie flat, if they have contractures, you might be looking at alternate sites that I'll go through. So let's talk about the difference between low bone mineral density and osteoporosis and what are overall screening guidelines for any population. So this data is pulled from the International Society of Clinical Densitometry. There were updated guidelines in 2019 for pediatrics and adult. So osteoporosis is characterized by low bone, ma low bone mass, an alteration in the microarchitecture of the bone tissue, leading to increased fragility and fracture. DEX is the gold standard to measure bone mineral density. It's widely available, low radiation, low cost. And the results that we get that you'll see on reports or that people will talk about are either T-scores or Z-scores. So what's a T-score? A T-score is the number of standard deviations that a patient's bone mineral density differs from a reference population. And that reference population is a group of 20 to 30-year-old females with low fracture risk. The Z-score is different. The Z-score is yet generally used in younger people and children, adolescents, because you're adjusting the T-score for age, for sex, and we have lots of multiple studies dedicated to establishing reference norms for children, adolescents, and young, and young adults. So if we look here at the table, so, and like I said, this is for any population. So indications for DEXA in an adult patient would be if there's history of transplantation, fractures, prolonged steroid use, the sites, I'll show you pictures soon of what they look like, but generally you're getting the femoral, femoral neck, the total hip area, the lumbar spine, you might be getting the forearm. And so low bone mineral density, um, in terms of moving away from like an osteopenia type, type of designation, would be that in males greater than 50 or postmenopausal females would be a T-score less than or equal to minus one standard deviation. In young adults, it would be a Z-score of less than or equal to minus two standard deviations. Osteoporosis, the definition in adults, is if um, it's a male greater than 50 or postmenopausal female, would be a T-score less than or equal to minus 2.5 standard deviations. That is enough to call it osteoporosis. Um, but in younger adults, you need also a history of significant fracture history, which might be vertebral compression fractures, low trauma femur fractures, or multiple long bone fractures. In children and young adults, why would we get a DEXA? Maybe history of fractures, delayed puberty, prolonged steroid use, um, any history of prolonged immobility. And the sites that we measure are different. Gen generally, we're getting the total body or the whole body. We'll do the lumbar spine. In certain instances, we might add the femur, the hip, the forearm. Low bone mineral density in a child or a young adult is defined by a Z-score less than or equal to minus two. And then to define osteoporosis in this age group, you need low bone mineral density plus significant fracture history or vertebral um, compression fracture alone, irrespective of what their bone mineral density is. So these are just images that you might see in a report of what a whole body DEXA might look like and what the lumbar spine would be. So hip and lateral distal femurs, these are traditionally measured in adults as it's a clinically significant fracture site with high risk of morbidity and mortality. We do know that these sites could be important to monitor in children and adults, younger adults with chronic illness. And there, we have a lot more normative data for even younger children so that we can, we can actually measure these sites. However, there's conflicting reports on the data that we have and how we interpret it and what kind of prediction we can do in terms of fracture risk in younger populations, especially with CF. We also can look at the distal one-third radius and the ultradistal radius, or you see here it's listed as a UD. This can be useful if there's hardware present, um, if there's impaired positioning, if you have someone who can't lie flat, but you can put their wrist out to measure quickly, it could be like five minutes any history of immobilization, as I said. Um, and so there's advantages of being um, easy to measure these locations. The outcome measures that we get from this, essentially your bone mineral content, bone mineral density, or Z-scores, they're less predictive of long bone fracture risk, but there is strong correlation in some reported studies between the ultradistal radius outcome measures and other measures of the lumbar spine and hip. So what are some of the limitations of getting or interpreting DEXA data. So one of the biggest issues is that there are different precision error measurements, precision error measurements that happen at different locations for different machines. There's different models of DEXA machines. And as a result, you really cannot compare findings between different 
machines in different locations. So if this can impact longitudinal monitoring, right? If I have someone who gets a DEX at one location and now they're moving somewhere else, how do we really compare that data? Also, how are we doing multi-center studies if one site has one type of model and another site has another type of model? Um, it's also really important to remember that, especially when you're looking at populations where there could be impaired growth or delayed puberty, that DEXA is essentially creating a 2D image of a 3D space, and that's called aerial bone mineral density, right? So you're not really getting volumetric bone mineral density. And so you're not able to detect well the depth of the bone. And as a result, the measures are an imperfect estimate of what's really the true volumetric density. So as a result, DEXA can underestimate density values for people who have smaller size bones or shorter stature and therefore overestimate for people who have taller bones. So you might see an increase in bone mineral density over time, but maybe it's because they're growing and their bones are literally just getting bigger. Or you might see a decline in the z-score as they're getting older, especially in younger population, and maybe it's because you're looking now at the growth chart and see they haven't grown. It's still really important to note that bones of different sizes still may not be equally as strong or resistant to fracture. So traditionally for children, adolescents, and young adults, DEXA measures are adjusted for age and sex. Um, but due to this effective bone size that we just discussed, um, we can now also adjust for height for age z-score, which essentially is the number of standard deviations of the actual height from the median height of the child's age group. This is a tool published by CHOP. You can see the um, website on the bottom. And what we can do is you can input um, their outcome measures that you get from the DEXA report, as well as their age and their height at the time that they were measured. And this can help account for size or stature differences, and there, of course, impact treatment decisions and monitoring. So let's talk about screening guidelines specifically for CF-related bone disease. Um, there are three published protocols put out, one by the CF Foundation that was published in 2005, there's the European Cystic Fibrosis Society from 2011, and the French CF Society from 2009. Um, the CF Foundation Clinical Care Guidelines were published prior to the International Society of Clinical Densitometry Guidelines in 2007, and then again in 2013, and that did include more normative data for DEXA outcomes, so I think that's why there's potentially a difference in what we're seeing between the European, the French, and CF. So the CF clinical care guidelines recommend screening for anyone over the age of 18 with CF and greater than eight years of age if they're considered high risk. And this means low body weight, lower FEV1 predicted, glucocorticoid use for greater than 90 days, cumulative, not just in a row, and history of delayed puberty. So the, while the European CF guidelines and the French, CF, the French guidelines recommend between like eight to 10 years and up across the board, regardless of clinical status. In terms of when we would repeat the DEXA scan, it generally is based on your T or your Z scores. So if your Z score is greater than minus one standard deviation, you can repeat the DEXA in about every five years. If the outcome results are between minus one and minus two, maybe repeat every two to four years. And if it's less than minus two standard deviations, generally you're repeating every year. Of course, if someone has a normal bone mineral density score at one time, but now their clinical status is changing, maybe they're going for transplant, they've had history of steroids, there's significant bone pain or fracture history, you can get it sooner. So this is just an example of a report of a teenage male with pancreatic insufficient CF with a history of poor weight gain and short stature. So it's from a Hologic DEXA machine, so that will always be reported on there, and this is specifically for the lumbar spine. And so that when we look at the DEXA results summary, I'm gonna make it bigger for you, you can see that their Z-score is minus one standard deviation, so that's within the normal range for this age group. However, I did talk about that. He has a history of short stature, so if I use that CHOP tool that I always go back to and that a lot of my colleagues do as well, we can see that for his lumbar spine bone mineral density, if I adjust for his height for age Z-score, that his Z-score is now actually minus 0.01 or essentially zero standard deviations. And this is really important as you're monitoring someone as they're growing. The other important thing to look at is as you're trending data is how do we in 
interpret the change. So as I talked about each center and machine, even technician has specific precision assessment measurements and the precision error represents the degree of repro reproducibility of a bone mineral content and bone mineral density results across that machine and operator. And so the precision error is then used to interpret or establish something called the least significant change or the LSC that you might see in a report. And this is the smallest difference in serial DEXA outcomes that could be considered statistically significant. And there's a lot of regulatory quality control that goes into if a technician changes, if there's a model update, anything changes at the center. So when you're looking at the report that you could see, this is a patient that had a lumbar spine and a whole body over different age ranges one year apart. This patient has very low T and Z scores, but when you look at the bone mineral, I don't have the Z score here, I have the T score, it should be a Z score. But when you look at the bone mineral density changes, um, you could see that this one here for the lumbar spine has a star. And that essentially saying is a statistically significant change. One thing I also like to point out is sometimes if you're looking at the spine and somebody maybe has a history of very low bone mineral density, and all of a sudden the, um, the Z-score is now improved, the bone mineral density is improved, but maybe their clinical picture hasn't improved, that might actually be a sign that there was a compression fracture and you might need to evaluate that further. So just be mindful of that. So when we talk about fracture and risk assessment, um, we know that generally fracture risk increases with lower aerial bone mineral density and bone mineral content Z-scores. However, you could still see bone fragility of people with Z-scores that are considered in the normal range. So there are other applications that help with fracture risk in general. There's something called the fracture risk assessment tool. We don't use that in pediatrics. But essentially, it's a computer-based algorithm using clinical risk factors to estimate an individual's 10-year fracture probability. Um, just a note, it's only approved in people over the age of 40, and it's not validated in people with CF. There are other methods that you might come across to evaluate fracture risk or history um, that you might see. So verte uh, vertebral fracture assessment, or VFA, this is specifically looking at the lumbar and thoracic spine to assess for um, vertebral deformities, which might indicate fracture and improvement or worsening. And then there's also the trabecular bone score or hip structural analysis. And these are analytical tools applied to DEXA images to look specifically at microarchitecture and geometry of the hip and the spine. So in terms of future directions, we know that assessment of bone health is still relatively new, largely based on expert opinion. We need more established evidence-based guidelines, particularly for children with chronic illness like CF. And we definitely need future studies looking at the longitudinal outcomes to assess the trajectory of bone mineral density measures in people with CF, especially through that transition from pediatrics to adult. Um, so I just want to acknowledge my um, Envision Mentorship Program, the CF Center that I get to work with, and all of my funding support. Thank you. <laughs> So I have a question for you. What other imaging tools can be used to assess um, bone health? Sure. So there are, some people will use MRI or um, high resolution peripheral quantitative computed tomography or CT, even ultrasound, but a lot of these are really only used in the research forum. Something especially like the CT scan has significant higher radiation burden or time spent in the study or, um, or cost. So they're really only used in a research setting and it's not what we're using generally um, when we're evaluating like pediatrics and adult with CF. Okay, here's a question. How do you obtain a DEXA that includes a BMD and muscle and fat measurements? So the, I wish I had a picture of what the table looks like, right? So the patient is lying there and the arm is over them, and that's taking the image, which in general, if you're getting whole body, lumbar spine, maybe is about 25 to 40 minutes max. Something like the wrist is maybe only five minutes. But the report will list the bone mineral content, the bone mineral density, it will show you your T-scores and Z-scores, but it will also break down the fat, the, um, the fat mass for you. Um, and so that was, should be all listed in the report. So they wouldn't have to request something special if they had a... Not at my center, okay. um, but if, 
you did not see it, there are trained clinical densitometrists that should be able to get that information from you from the report itself. Okay, good. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Thanks. Okay, I'd like to introduce our final speaker of the afternoon. Dr. Stalvey brings an endocrine perspective to studies of cystic fibrosis. He currently leads a research and clinical care effort at the University of Alabama at Birmingham, focusing on CF endocrine disorders. His lab investigates the pathogenesis of CF-related bone disease and, contribute, and contributions um, of CFTR during growth and bone metabolism. A second aim of his lab focuses on the influence of CFTR on glucose regulation and beta cell function. Dr. Stavi is leading the endocrine substudy of PROMISE, focusing on aspects of glucose metabolism and bone health. Additionally, he is the co-PI of the BEGIN study, which focuses on many of these aspects in infants and young, young children with CF. And finally, he has over 20 years of experience with um, uh, clinical care and working with children with CF. Dr. Salvi. How do I, how do I start it? Yeah. There. Mm -hmm. Can I start? No, sorry. No, that's fine. So, um, Thank you, Val. I've, I've known Valerie for many, many years. And uh, I, it's a pleasure to speak to you all here uh, at the end of the meeting. Um, just a few things, uh, and these aren't kind of disclosures, but not really disclosures. But, uh, you know, it's the end of the meeting, so uh, I recognize a lot of people in the room. If you throw eggs and tomatoes at me, I'm going to know who you are. Um, and I will stand up here and just talk as long as you want me to and, and answer questions and whatnot because, you know, why not? It's who knows what the life takes us. Second, I'm a peds endocrinologist. Um, although I have been working in the adult field for 20 years now, um, many of the drugs that I'm going to discuss and talk about uh, are things that are black box and, and peds. And so um, I, I can't per se go into detail about the discussion on those, but I will talk about uh, the potential of them. Third, as, as Val said, as I said, I've been doing this for 20 years, so I'm going to stand up here and tell you what I really think. You know, I'm going to go offside the map and tell you outside of the, what's in the data, what I what I do in clinical practice, and and it may be anecdotal, but it's what what we do in the in the day to day setting, um, because honestly, as the previous speaker pointed out, the the last time that the bone health guidelines were updated for the CF Foundation was close to twenty years ago, so it is well overdue, and I challenge the 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 new providers coming into the space to push for. Uh, that to, to be re-looked at. Um, from a disclosure standpoint, I do have grant funding from the CF Foundation as well as I'm a member of the, uh, the uh, Global CF Advisory Board for Vertex Pharmaceuticals. As you've heard already, uh, CF bone disease continues to be one of the, one of the leading comorbidities in CF uh, with about 14% of all ages. An interesting thing, about CF bone disease, uh, when you compare it to CF-related diabetes, and CF-related diabetes, it plateaus out around 30 years of age. And that's not what we see in CF bone disease. It continues to happen well beyond that and, and whatnot as the, our patients get older and older. Uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the multi kind of factorial nature of CF bone disease. But I'm showing this slide because when we talk about treatments and stuff, a lot of times we need to think about the aspects of it and where we can intervene. And so whether that be nutritionally, whether it be due to frequent exacerbations, whether it be because they've had a, a transplant and they're on high dose steroids, or other comorbidity issues that are associated with bone health. Now, 
one thing that I want the audience to really understand from the standpoint of treatment is that bone is dynamic. It is a constant state of turnover. At least that's what we want it to be, right? It is our, our savings account for our calcium as we go into later life. Um, it is a state of where you have a, a, a constant resorption of bone, which is driven by things such as corticosteroids, PTH, rank ligand, uh, MCSF, other cytokines, whatnot, uh, that are driving the formation of osteoclasts and the, the eating up of the bone, as well as laying down new bone, which are typically driven by your anabolic hormones, such as growth hormone, IGF-1, testosterone, estrogen, insulin, etc. cetera. Uh, bone turnover, when we look at the different disease states, and, and you'll see where I'm going with this in just a second, uh, we, we think about it from the standpoint of what's normal is a balance between osteoblast and osteoclast activity. Um, but in like a high tur turnover state, such as uh, sex steroid deficiency, increased PTH, uh, increased thyroid hormone levels, you'll see increased osteoclast activity and increased osteoblast to try and compensate, but still a, a dysfunction. In low bone turnover states, such as liver disease, uh, anorexia, we see a dramatic reduction in the anabolic drive for bone formation. So as uh, many of you may or may not be familiar, for example, bisphosphonates don't work well in anorexia because that's not the problem but they do work well in some of the states we're gonna talk about in a second. And then uncoupled bone uh, turnover, which is typically in glucocorticoids, CF, and I love zero gravity, so we can tell our patients, you know, they're like astronauts. But uh, it, it's, a, it's a problem where they have an exaggerated osteoclastic activity, an exaggerated uh, bone resorption with a decreased uh, formation at the same time. So what we've discussed so far in this session has to do with proper nutrition to support bone health, vitamin and mineral supplementation, the importance of, of physical activity, and I must admit to our previous speaker, I've got a bad knee, so I didn't get up and do this, the exercises with you. Um, I, I wanted to, but I didn't. Um, and then the assessment of bone health and bone density, which you just heard about. So what's next? And that's when I say, when considering treatment, you want to evaluate for underlying conditions and contributors. So are there other things at play? Is this a child with delayed puberty and poor growth? Is this somebody with CF-related diabetes, which we know contributes to bone health? Is this somebody with celiac disease? There are increasing reports of the number of celiac patients in our CF community, um, which is definitely consistent with uh, abnormalities in bone health. Is this a problem with hypogonadism? And I'll talk about that in just a second. Um, is there a problem with frequent exacerbations? And do we have iatrogenic contributors, such as oral and inhaled corticosteroids or the exacerbations and whatnot? What I show on the right, um, when I talk about other things to think about, these are actually bone micro CT scans of a CF rat and just showing the difference in the architecture of the bone health of the CF rat versus a non-CF rat, which does not have all these things. So the contribution of CFTR and the impact on bone, which we'll talk about later in the, the, uh, in the era of modulators. Now, I wanna uh, highlight, this is a wonderful article. And for those of you who haven't seen it, uh, 2019, uh, the Journal of Cystic Fibrosis put out an endocrine, uh, kind of a sub, whatever you want to call it, uh, essentially a, 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 an issue or addition where they focused on the endocrine issues of CF. And a couple of the things they really hit on, one article was on pathogenesis and impact of bone health, but then one was on uh, fracture risk and the the issues with treatment. And so this is a table that I borrowed from that article. Uh, Missy Putman is a good friend, and so I, I 
was happy to just steal from her and put it up here. But it's something that you really, we think about from the standpoint of how to approach bone health because things are dramatically different than when I started this so long ago. Um, we don't rush to put people on, th on therapies that we did 20, 25 years ago. Um, so, treatment. Well, first of all, lifestyle interventions, nutritional supplementation, and addressing other contributors should be the initial approach. No question. Okay? They need to be nutritionally sound. They need to be on calcium replacement. They need to have adequate vitamin D. These are all things that are just no-brainers. Um, but then addressing secondary causes. And then from a therapeutic intervention standpoint, this is where I call you back to that previous picture I showed you of targeting what might be going on and addressing it on an individual perspective kind of thing. Uh, and that's what takes us into the different therapies. So first of all, anti-resorptive therapies. Bisphosphonates have been the only real drug that's been studied in the CF population uh, and have, has been studied for many years now um, that work, that it works through essentially inhibiting bone resorption through shutting down the osteoclast. Very useful uh, from a standpoint of post lung transplant, high steroid use, et cetera, uh, and, and so that should be taken into account. They can be given either orally or intravenously. Um, as I said, it's the only one that's been studied in both children and adults. Uh, or Intravenously can be given three months or every 12 months. Orally can be given weekly or monthly. Uh, typically, they're good for about three to five years. Uh, they do have potential for complications. Uh, we do see things like esophagitis, uh, gastric ulcers, jaw osteonecrosis, and the atypical fractures that you can see. They, it, you know, they do show some improvement in bone health, but not necessarily good bone, and that's one of the problems we run into. Uh, additionally, they cross the placenta. So if you're giving this to a child or a young girl who has the potential to be pregnant down the road, you may be giving it to her offspring as well. Other anti-resorptive therapies that have been less, uh, have not been studied, uh, denosumab is one that has a lot of potential, I think, in CF. It just hasn't been studied. It's a monoclonal antibody against rate ligand. Uh, it inhibits osteoclast differentiation and activation. It is approved for glucocorticoid-induced osteoporosis. There are no studies in CF. Um, there is a high risk of bone loss once it's stopped. And so most people will follow it with a, another anti-resorptive therapy such as bisphosphonate kind of thing. Um, it, it does have a risk of serious infection. As you can see there, skin, abdominal, urinary, ear, uh, periodontal. Uh, and it's obviously contraindicated in pregnancy. Then there's the selective estrogen receptor modulators. These are only, are only appropriate for postmenopausal women. They should never be used in children or men. Um, there are no studies in CF-related, uh, excuse me, CF bone disease. But as our patients continue to age, maybe that's going to change because we're going to have more and more patients that are getting into the age group where they might be uh, these drugs might be applicable. Now I'm going to turn to the anabolic therapies. Uh, teriparatide is a parathyroid hormone analog, uh, and a, I don't even know how to say it, honestly, about a, 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 balo, a baloparatide is a, a PTH-related peptide analog. Both work through stimulating, uh, through stimulating bone formation. There has been a case report of four CF patients demonstrating improvement by treatment with teriparatide. Uh, the, one of the downsides of these drugs is it's, it's, all, it's basically limited to two years. It has, this is where I was talking about one of the drugs that has a clear black box warning. We do not use it in kids whatsoever because of the risk of osteosarcoma. It is a theoretical risk but you're not going to find a pediatrician that's going to do it. Um, at least I wouldn't. 
And so that's part of the reason why when I start thinking about whether or not this would be a candidate for these kinds of drugs, they need to go to my adult colleagues uh, as opposed to myself. All right, but what do I do? And this is where I'm going off. I, one of the joys of being an endocrinologist is we get to prescribe anabolic drugs legally. <laughs> And, um, and, and a lot of, uh, you know, from the state of Alabama, a lot of football players kind of like that. Um, but I look at the, the, I really take into account what is my scenario. So is this a teenager that has low bone mineral density but has never had a fracture and maybe has evidence of delayed puberty or poor growth? Well, perhaps they, they just haven't achieved that yet. You know, is this a young adult who is the likelihood of them getting a lung transplant is pretty minimal for at least 10 to 15 years, you know, and they haven't had a fracture. Do I want to waste my time with a bisphosphonate or try some other avenue? Okay. Versus an older adult who, if they had like a, a, a cervical fracture or a, a sternal fracture, a vertebral fracture would have the potential to really take them out of the picture and have a huge impact on their overall health. So that's where I talk about other anabolic therapies. Um, insulin is a good one. So, uh, you know, it treats the hyperglycemia and whatnot associated with CF-related diabetes. We talk about oftentimes in CF-related diabetes that insulin is not just about treating hyperglycemia and type like we see in type 1 and type 2 but treating the insulin deficient state using it for the anabolic potential insulin has both direct and indirect effects on bone health directly stimulating osteoblast activity uh, indirectly through by improving hyperglycemia, the negative effects of hyperglycemia on inflammation, et cetera. I pull this from uh, an article in 2017, but uh, it also increases weight and lean body mass. So it's, it's improving the quote unquote good stress on our bones. So stimulating the activity, whatnot, uh, so that our bones are, are have a good turnover standpoint. And like I said, is it stimulates osteoblast activity. Uh, next is testosterone. So one of the things we do at the University of Alabama is we screen yearly uh, as part of our yearly labs for the men is testosterone levels. We know that it's increasing higher and higher or at least the, the rate that we're finding it, it not necessarily that it's, in, in, it's becoming more of a problem, but we just didn't look for it previously. Um, we have, not only are we doing that, but we're being involved with the Men's Health Initiative and whatnot, but screening for hypogonadism in men, uh, looking, I, I have a lower threshold for treatment than my adult colleagues um, because of the positive effects of testosterone on improving lean body mass, improving bone mass, improving these other aspects of their clinical health, as opposed to just making sure this is not somebody who wants to, to get jacked to go to the gym. Uh, estrogen replacement, you know, this is something that you have to really stay on top of because a lot of our colleagues in the OBGYN arena will slap a patient on a progesterone only medication. And that is about the worst thing we could do for bone. So making sure that they're not on those kinds of things, that they're on a combined estrogen replacement. If they have problems with uh, irregular menses or whatnot that makes us think that they have uh, problems with hypogonadism in females, you know, being on top of it and, and moving forward. And then one of the things we've seen, especially since uh, Trikafta came out, is a lot of the PCO symptoms that are a lot of the women that we take care of are seeing. And so they're looking for uh, uh, birth control therapies and whatnot where they weren't in the past. And so making sure that they're getting the right kind of drugs. What about other anabolic therapies? Well, uh, oxandrolone is one that I use frequently. 
It is, oxandrolone is a weak androgen. It's derived from testosterone. It's given orally. Um, it can be used both in males and females. Uh, it was, it's been long used for females with uh, Turner syndrome to help with growth. In young kids, it does stimulate growth, but nowhere as close to things like growth hormone. Um, it does stimulate osteoblast activity. As I said, you can use it in males and females. It's used a lot of times in wasting, uh, both things like everything from post-cancer, HIV, et cetera. Uh, I use a lot lower doses than they do because of the risk of things on the liver and whatnot, and I monitor liver function, and as as well as you know making sure they have good liver function before I start them on it. But it's it's something that has been quite successful a lot of times in in uh, young adults and in adolescents with uh, CF growth hormone. So many of you, if you've read our literature and whatnot, well, now I'm a big growth hormone advocate in CF because I'm a strong believer in your height and how that impacts your lung health, how it impacts your overall health. But um, growth hormone has been shown uh, with multiple studies to improve uh, height and growth velocity in children and adolescents with CF. It's been shown to improve bone accrual and improve lean body mass. However, there's been no studies that have, well, there's not been, there's not that there hasn't been studies, because in fact I did one in adults, uh, but it was a problem when we looked at, from the standpoint of bone health, and you look at the use of growth hormone, it's a much longer kind of picture. You, you can't, it's a, it's a prolonged therapy for years and years. You can't just do like a, a six month or 10 month or a one year therapy kind of thing. Um, what's next? Well, the impact of modulators. And this is, we don't know. Um, we, as, as Val mentioned, I'm one of the co-PIs of the PROMISE study where we're looking at, at bone de density uh, on, on the, uh, on Trikafta or excuse me, ETI. Um, we have actually, not only that, um, we've, we've gotten data on the 12 to 18 months um, but we don't have yet a analyzed the, the 24 and beyond data kind of stuff. Um, we will be continuing it out because, as I mentioned, you know, bone is something that doesn't turn over. I mean, no, no pun there. It doesn't turn over rapidly. <laughs> it takes a while to look at. And so we'll be looking at that long term. Begin is very exciting because for the first time we're collecting data in these very young kids and looking at not only bone density but body composition and whatnot. And we're going to have uh, some early evidence of what's going on um, at this young age between three and six years of age and how that compares to, to uh, healthy children at that age. Uh, and with that, I'm going to end and send my acknowledgments to the CF Foundation for both Promise, the Promise Endocrine Substudy, and Begin. And I will take questions, or we can go to the social. <laughs> Thank you, Mike, for that presentation. You have some questions. Do you think liver disease is an important criteria to consider adding to the bone mineral density guidelines for patients with CF? Absolutely. Um, liver plays into multiple aspects of bone health um, because, you, you know, you have to remember that your liver is what metabolizes your vitamin D into the active, I mean, into the storage form and then your, your kidneys convert it into the active form. But if you've got bad, I've seen a lot of patients with bad liver disease that have very low vitamin D levels and whatnot that's contributing to their bone health where we have to like jumpstart them and move right on to the, the activated vitamin D. Next question. And, and from the anabolic standpoint. So you're like you're, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to yeah. interrupt you there, Val. But the, um, you're like, for example, your serum levels of IGF-1 come from the liver. And there's a, a, a clear correlation with IGF-1 concentrations in CF and your bone health. So, you know, we know that these individuals have low IGF-1 values, 
but how, how, how does this play into things? And absolutely, in the case of liver disease, they're going to have even lower. All right. So in a fresh um, post-transplant patient, many transplant centers place patients on biphosphonates. Would you recommend use of anabolic like so, so um, that that's kind of uh, that's that's a good. It's an interesting uh, treatment regimen. A lot of patient, a lot of centers do, and I, I advocate for it honestly because there's such a massive amount of bone loss because of the high steroids post transplant, and that's part of the reason why I try to reserve the use of bisphosphonates. Like if it's somebody that is you know, the likelihood that they're, if, if they're just not, if they're not a transplant candidate and they've had, and I start thinking about, well, a pathologic fracture could have a serious negative impact on them, then I'm going to go ahead and use a bisphosphonate therapy. But if that's, if it's different, if they're a transplant candidate and the likelihood that they're going to get transplanted is a few years down the road, well, then I'm going to look for other avenues because I'd rather reserve the bisphosphonate therapy for the post-lung transplant therapy or post-lung transplant time. Um, teriparatide, I, I don't know the data on that in a, in a, a transplant population um, because, you know, then you're really getting into... You know, not only are you using an anabolic drug, that's why we don't touch, you know, post-transplants with growth hormone, you know, with a 10-foot pole um, because of the, the potential for precipitating something. All right. Dr. Williams has a question for you. So for the pediatric population that you are prescribing growth hormone, what indications or tests are you using to get coverage? So, uh, Dr. Williams is not allowed to ask that. As a <laughs> peds endocrinologist, that's the kind of thing she should ask me over a beer when I can say under the table how I get it done. Um, it, it's uh, unfortunately, it's still uh, so many years ago. Uh, I, some of you may know this, some of you don't, that uh, the original producers of growth hormone was Genentech, who made Palmazine, or who still makes Palmazine. And so they had kind of an interest in the CF space, and they tried to get growth hormone approved for CF. We did many studies and whatnot, uh, and it showed that it improved uh, growth, it improved uh, lean body mass, it improved weight, it improved all these things. Um, but the the studies, it, it, according to the FDA, was not didn't show enough in, in lung function, which was not obviously the focus of Genentech, but still, that was what, where we ran into it. So in other words, there is not an indication for CF. Um, so you still have to go through the same rigmarole and workup that you do a healthy kid that doesn't have CF for the sake of growth. The way we do it at UAB is kids that are around six to seven years of age, because we know that's a predictor of their final height and how they're going to do overall, um, that are below the 10th percentile, typically get referred to me to evaluate to see if I can help out. Um, and we're, we have the luxury in our state uh, to look at things like mid-parental height and whatnot, where, which many other states don't. Um, and, and then I do the, the standard testing and, and everything. Um, do they have growth hormone deficiency? The, the literature would say no. Can I say it on paper? It's a different story. So. Thank you for your honest um, <laughs> Okay, we're going to answer one or two more questions. Um, is anyone tracking physical activity or resistance training in combination in the PROMISE or BEGIN study? Do you know the answer to that? Um, I don't think anybody's tracking the resistance training. We published something uh, on one of our patients who, in, who utilized resistance training uh, on top of growth hormone therapy uh, years ago, who really had some outstanding outcomes um, in, in 
some of my nutrition colleagues at, at UAB um, did that. And, um, but I don't believe that it's necessarily being tracked and promised or, or begin. I, I, I'm, I'm almost sure it's not being tracked and begin, but um, whether or not anyone is doing like a side study and promises is different. Okay, this is an easy one. What is your preferred mode of treatment for um, testosterone, injectable or topical? Um, I, I, injectable is my preferred. Um, you get, I tend to get better results. Uh, the topical is has a lot of concerns from the standpoint of not only do you have to use like typically gloves when you put it on, if you have a partner that you sleep next to, it can rub off on the bed and then get onto the partner. Um, it, it, we don't get the same, at least in my experience, I haven't gotten the same levels, even though it's done daily, you know, um, with the topical. Uh, and so I get much better levels and more patient compliance by doing the injectable. I have started moving to uh, a sub-Q as opposed to an IM injection with testosterone uh, just because of uh, uh, treatment burden and whatnot of some of the patients. Um, but I still don't have a ton of anecdotal experience with that yet. But typically, yeah, I use the, um, the uh, most patients will prefer to go with uh, an intramuscular injection, and they typically do it either once a month. Most of them end up doing it um, once every two weeks. All right. I'm going to answer one more question. If CF pediatric patient has short stature with decelerating growth percentile but passes the growth hormone stem test, do you still recommend growth hormone replacement therapy? Well, I think all CF patients should be on growth hormone. Um, I think we all should be on a little bit of growth hormone. No, um, but uh, yeah, so uh, I, there have been patients that, um, so years ago, um, idiopathic short stature was approved and tr was covered by insurance. And many of our CF patients would have fallen under that category because they, you know, depending on how you do the growth hormone stem test, they would pass. Uh, and I have gotten some approved, even though they pass a stem test, but they're so far below the curve. And I provide the literature and whatnot um, because it does help with growth and it has other benefits besides just linear height in CF. Because we've seen it. Yeah. yeah. You've seen it as well. You've yes, seen that seen personally. It. All right, I just want to um, thank y'all for coming to this session. We made it we made last it day. Off to the party. Off to the party.